It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. And now, please welcome our most special guests, the new Ig Nobel Prize winners. Hello and welcome to episode 311 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 23rd of September, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Composer and sound designer, Peter Miller. Hello. And viral immunology student at Queensland University of Technology, Ross Balch. Hi there. I should, uh, I should probably um, clarify that I study viruses. I'm not um, famous by virtue of being shared <laughs> um, you know, out of control on the internet, uh, at least as far as I know. Maybe you'll go viral as a result of this episode. Maybe. Maybe. We can hope. Uh, but today is one of our favourite episodes of all time because we're going to be taking a look at the 2018 Ig Nobel Awards, which were announced last week. They're always a lot of fun. But before we begin, Wednesday, October 10th, 2018 at 7pm. That's our big live event in Melbourne where we'll have the esteemed astronomer, Dr. Pamela Gay, uh, giving a talk about the technology revolution in astronomy, and then she'll be taking your questions and answering them. And we'll finish up with a recording of Science on Top with her as a guest star. I'm really looking forward to it. Tickets are on sale now at scienceontop.com live. Only $20, which I think is pretty good value for a night of science and entertainment. And all proceeds go to the non-profit Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which does great science outreach work. So that's Wednesday, 10th of October at 7 p.m. in Carlton, uh, scienceontop.com slash live. And a few days after that, Dr. Pamela Gay will be in Sydney with a host of other intriguing speakers at the Australian Skeptics National Convention. I'll be there in the audience, and I think Lucas is seeing if he can make it. I can't make it this year, unfortunately, but um, it's, uh, I can't recommend highly enough uh, checking it out. It's a very high quality event with very interesting talks. Uh, and I've, I've never once regretted heading down uh, ever. So <laughs> Yeah, no, they're always a lot of fun and full of very interesting stuff. So that'll be Saturday the 13th and Sunday the 14th of October in Sydney. Tickets are on sale at convention.skeptics.com.au. So now let's begin with the Ig Nobel Prizes, which were presented, as I said last week, at Harvard University. These are the awards for science that first makes you laugh and then makes you think. And first up is the Medicine Prize, which went to two Americans, Mark Mitchell and David Wartinger, for using roller coaster rides to try to hasten the passage of kidney stones. Uh, a very novel technique, I'll agree, but this actually, I think, mm. was inspired by a patient of uh, Dr. Wartinger's who said that, you know, he went on a roller coaster, I think it was in Orlando, and a few minutes later passed a kidney stone. So he went back on the uh, roller coaster again, and a few minutes after that, passed another one. I think this happened three times in total, and these doctors just went, "We can't pass that sort of anecdotal evidence." And they, uh, when well, they did a three D three D printed model of a kidney, filled it up with urine, one of their own samples of urine, and put some kidney stones in it, and then tracked the movement of that kidney stone over the course of. I think it was 60 roller coaster rides. So that could be a novel new treatment, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> it could be great fun. I thought this was really, I was like, this actually doesn't deserve an ignoble. Like, it's just interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is funny. <laughs> it's not a yeah, conventional Yeah, I guess it is kind of funny. Of, and I read an interview where it's like, well, of course I use my own urine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny, <laughs> actually. Um, we, uh, I, I teach microbiology uh, at, uh, at university and um, the students have to produce their own sample and uh, sort of, you know, plate it and sort of see what stuff grows on there normally. 
And one student um, was like, oh, you know, I don't want to take the sample. It's disgusting. And I said, well, would you rather use someone else's? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. You know. <laughs> but of course, in this one, you actually have to use urine because if it's just water or any mm. other liquid, it's an other variable that you have to control Absolutely. for. Yeah, the specific gravity would be off by enough, you know. Yeah, it's, I, I really like the, um, the listeners should check out the little uh, 3D printed model if they can. It's uh, it's fantastic. It looks like um, one of those games you used to play when you're a kid where there's like a little ball yes. bearing in it <laughs> and you have to kind of get it in through the, the maze, which I suppose is the general concept. Yeah. I like, so, that the, I like that the ride was called the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. <laughs> mm. That is it. A fair, a fair amount of big thunder screaming going on from that first patient, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I guess the idea is, though, that if you, like these roller coaster rides are able to dislodge sort of smaller kidney stones, which can be mm. passed with, I guess, relatively painlessly <laughs> compared to a larger kidney stone, mm. um, then it could be a really, really good thing um, overall before it becomes an expensive and really debilitating kind of issue yeah i think there's also a second side of this research which actually no one uh, has picked up on um it looks like in the press but this is actually for me as well if you have larger kidney stones that you know about um this is actually a pretty good warning not to mm. go on a roller coaster mm. because i imagine the forces uh that would act upon a larger kidney stone would actually be larger than they would be on these smaller ones so if you have kidney stones that you would rather not get forced through your uh uh, your your urinary tract uh, in a quite painful way. You should probably avoid roller coasters, mm. actually, if you have a larger one. And I, I think yes. that's actually not – that's not, like, nothing, you know. That's no. actually no. good information to know if you're a patient. Absolutely um, right. Sure. Yeah. Didn't they find it was something like a 60 or 70 percent chance that the 60 or 70 percent of the stones would actually move on the roller coaster? Like, well, what they it was found. quite a large that. number. They actually f- yeah, it was. The, the interesting thing, though, was they found – 63.89% of the time, while the kidneys were in the back of the roller coaster, they would move. But in the front, the passage rate was only 16.67%. <laughs> so that's another thing. Why is it there's so much more uh, movement at the back of the roller coaster? And I guess I think it makes it easier for people to then to know which end of the roller coaster they want to get on the next time they're on a ride. Do they want a really big roller coaster ride or a little one? It's interesting. I, I think the moment, like the momentary force, mm. might be just just a little bigger at the back than it is at the front. Yeah. I'm not a physicist, so I can't <laughs> explain why that is. But I I do I do think that is the reason. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Uh, and I, I mean, I love a good roller coaster as it is. So I mean, I don't need any excuse to be told that it's good for my health. And, <laughs> Whereas if I was told, look, you have little kidney stones, but here's the good news: you can just go on a roller coaster. I'd be like, well. Can I have the surgery? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, clearly you're in Australia with our health insurance and our health care yeah, and not other true. countries. Absolutely. But, um, but no, that is another issue to think about, of course. We always talk about individualised medicine being the holy grail and where we're working towards. It could be that you'll be at, you know, those little balls that you sort of sit in and they spin you around in certain oh, you like, see them at carnivals a lot i was thinking of like those the, and yeah the, but but it, at some point they can do a scan of your kidney they'll be able to know right we need to move it this way this <laughs> way and this way to get it the right motion you'll sit in one of those with a little prescription from your doctor and it'll dislodge your kidney stone for you that would be the most depressing show ride oh. <laughs> It's actually, uh, I don't know if any of you played Theme Hospital back in uh, 1999. Um, uh, But uh, basically, it's a a game where you manage a a, a fantasy hospital, right? And uh, all of the, the, and they actually just released a a follow-up two-point hospital. And um, all of the maladies in in that game are sort of fictitious and uh, comical. And so are the treatments. And this sort of um, centrifuge machine just uh, strikes me as something you might see in one of these sort of, you know, comical computer manager games, you know, like the roller coaster tycoon and all that stuff. It's uh, it's kind of an interesting one. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's outside the realms of possibility. And again, it makes you laugh, but there's a lot of good things to think about with this sort of a thing. It's very cool. 
So the Anthropology Prize went to an international team from Sweden, Romania, Denmark, the Netherlands, Germany, UK, Indonesia and Italy for collecting evidence in a zoo that chimpanzees imitate humans about as often and about as well as humans imitate chimpanzees. Now, I wouldn't have thought that either of those happen very often, but I think the key there is in a zoo. And I think you do often get people jokingly imitating the chimpanzees and they do sometimes imitate them back, don't they? There are uh, there are too many YouTube videos of, um, you know, in certain zoos, they, they prefer these enclosures with sort of large glass walls, mm-hmm. you know, and you, you sort of, you walk through a kind of indoor experience and the cages are sort of more like fish tanks, I guess, but with oxygen uh, <laughs> or, or more oxygen, I should say. And um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite often you will see a, a sort of one of those funny vine type videos of someone imitating, mm. uh, imitating the, the a chimp or even like an ape. And, uh, or, you know, well, I mean like larger, larger apes like gorillas, uh, chimps or apes, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, like, and then the, 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 the monkey variant uh, <laughs> imitating them back. Uh, and I actually find them very wholesome myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of a few of a video with um, doing magic tricks in front of chimps and, you know, hiding the ball under the cups and moving the cups around. The chimps just get really angry when you do that to them. <laughs> they, just, <laughs> they go ape, so to speak. Well, one of the one of the things about this um, particular re- piece of research, though, was to do with um, how the the implications that that mimicking might have some kind of um, communication function rather than just being a learning function so so the, so that the the ability to for um not so much, I'm assuming that the humans are not really trying to communicate with the apes but the apes must might find that there is some kind of useful um, uh, socialization function in the in the um, imitations which I thought was quite interesting I mean, I actually, I wouldn't write off the idea that humans are trying to uh, communicate with the chimps, even if like subconsciously, it's, it's sort of one of those things where, as you said, it's um, imitation is like something that is very, uh, it's very ingrained in our species. Uh, and one might even say genus. And I, I think sometimes, even though we think we're joking, a lot of the time, I wouldn't be surprised if we're actually just kind of following an instinct to sort of imitate these animals that are so close to us i don't know if uh if you if you have a a, a kind of dog that likes to sort of cock its head to the side mm-hmm. and uh i you know you find yourself doing it as well when you're playing with the dog or trying to communicate you sort of mimic these animals and uh, i i think you just sort of i think it's an instinct that we all have uh which is why this this research wasn't surprising i guess to me i think the fact that the primates would do it uh is is sort of Par for the course, mm. but I think the more interesting one is how often humans are doing it to the chimps. Mm. But I guess I guess humans are sort of inclined to connect as well because I was reminded of the way that you interact with like a really young baby or a really young child, or even the way that two little toddlers like mm. you can't communicate to them with language really. Like I mean, obviously you do, and that's how they learn. But there's a lot of like poking your tongue out and copying mm. their face. And it's it's just, it's kind of making a social connection and a social bond, you know, however fleeting. That's actually and a I good point. How- it's also there's the the baby voice that we do, the who's a little boy, like that, you know. We even though we're not imitating their speech pattern necessarily, but it's it's still a form of imitation. That's, that's and the baby point. actually imitates you to the extent that it can. It, it's. And so I'm not surprised that other members, you know, other species who are so closely related to mm. us would have a really similar kind of way. I also wonder, like, if, and I, I hadn't actually read the original article, but if um, how many of the humans that were interacting were children with the chips. Ah, that's a good point. I didn't see that. I don't know that they actually delineated it in yeah. the research. Mm-hmm. Just because just from having frequently been to the zoo with my own children recently, like kids often seem to have a bit more playfulness than adults. Like, you know, I'm standing around seriously looking at the chimps or trying to talk to my friend, but yeah. They did also say that uh, the the chimpanzees uh, evidenced imitation recognition, but only when the visitors were imitating their actions, not just their postures. So if you go into that chimpanzee posture sort of thing, 
they don't think you're imitating them. They just think you've got really wide shoulders. You're just doing what yeah. you do. Yeah. Um, they expressed by returned imitation. So they, they, they show, yes, I recognize that you're imitating me by imitating them back in 36% of the cases. So it wasn't across the board. No. It was only four out of the five chimpanzees that expressed imitation. So... I guess, it, I guess it doesn't sound surprising when you think about it, but what I, I think the thing is here is that this is some science that actually kind of backs it up rather than just, you know, intuitively thinking that that must be the case. Yeah. The Biology Prize was awarded to an international team of eight scientists for demonstrating that wine experts can reliably identify by smell the presence of a single fly in a glass of wine. Penny, you're a wine expert. Have you often... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you reckon you could tell if there's a fly in your wine just by the smell of it? Oh, I could tell if the fly came from the left side <laughs> of, the, <laughs> of the mountain. I could, like, you know those articles that often pop up, like people can't even tell the difference between red and white right, yeah. wine? I'm like, yeah. yeah, duh. Like, no one can tell. It all tastes the same. <laughs> Well, after the first few bottles anyway. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> but respect to people who can. Yeah, I, I was thinking, yeah, so apparently the female Drosophila flies make this particular pheromone which will attract males and this can actually be detected in wine. Just one nanogram of it will give a drink an unpleasant smell and taste that can be detected by an expert. So... Apparently the males don't produce this, so if a fly goes into your wine, you better hope it's a male fly. Um, <laughs> I found this quite insane that people could detect this much of the pheromone, and that, that we would be, or that humans could be as sensitive to a pheromone. And I guess, I guess, like people who are wine tasters would be have a, I don't know, a better developed sense of taste than other people. I don't know if Maybe, it's just a, training or if there's some genetic advantage. Well, they have a larger sort of, data set to compare to. I mean, mm, tasted a lot more. Absolutely. Than, and smell yeah. I mean, it's, we have. it's kind of interesting though, isn't it? Because when I remember a, a study where some researchers used red food dye in white wine and asked food ex, uh, some wine experts to uh, characterize the wines and none of them actually realized they were tasting a white that had been made to look like a red. So it's sort of, these studies are kind of interesting to me. I, I actually think it is more tangible, though, that um, this pheromone could have uh, such a strong effect. Because, I mean, ther pheromones are evolutionarily evolved to be the most effective odors, essentially, that are produced. So in terms of, like, activating certain receptors, that is their entire job. And the, the idea that you could detect very small amounts of it isn't so far-fetched. It, it reminds me of uh, goat's milk and... If you uh, if you raise female goats in the presence of males, the milk has that very characteristic goaty flavor that a lot of people dislike. However, if you raise the females without the presence of males around, they don't have the same uh, pheromones. Wow. And the milk is apparently a lot sweeter and a lot, like, actually very tasty, better than cow's milk by a long way, I've, I, I've been told. So, yeah, this is actually another sort of variation on this, like, pheromones having a very powerful impact on the way even as humans unrelated to these animals producing it actually um, experience this food. That's cool. I've not heard of that. That's, mm, interesting. that's interesting. Mm. One of the things about this um, this article too, I noticed that this is kind of covered uh, a little bit across the um, interwebs, uh, and almost absolutely uniformly, they would put a photograph of a glass of wine with a normal kind of like house a blowfly, <laughs> house fly in it. and it's it isn't it isn't that story. They're, they're, they're specifically talking about fruit flies, which are tiny mm. little mm. tiny little flies. So yeah. um, also, it's a lot easier to spot. A large house fly. A blow fly. Yeah, and then a little bit <laughs> <Yeah>. of <laughs> That's right. I dread to think of the insects that I have drunk in glasses of <laughs> Oh, it would be huge, right? Like the ones you didn't even realise. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Like barbecues in summer. And... Anyway. And that's not even going to what's in a meat pie or a sausage roll. Oh. <laughs> oh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> In incidental insect consumption is actually really high. It's, you, eat, you eat a lot of insects you don't know you're eating. And at the same time, we're sort of 
grossed out and offended by the notion of it, but we keep reading about how that may be the way that we should go in terms of environmental you impact. Know what, yeah. Protein. Yeah. I would totally eat insects. Yeah. I, well, in fact, I, I have. I've eaten grubs and insects, mm. and I mm. don't have a problem with it at all. And that was just in your last bottle of wine. And that was just for dinner. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of interesting. I, I got to eat some insects in uh, uh, Bangkok recently, and um, some of them are... Uh, I feel like actually whether you will enjoy insects depends entirely on your 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 sort of pre uh, like what you already are into. Like I, I don't particularly enjoy seafood. I, I found a lot of insects have a very prawn like fra- flavor, uh, but but in a very reduced way. Whereas some of the insects uh, like the grubs were a bit more meaty, and I actually ate those pretty well without any problems. So sure, yeah, it's sort of interesting how. Um, but it also I, depends I think, on how they're going to be prepared too. I mean, you know, you, you don't absolutely. you don't kind of like kind of go for a cow and just take a big chomp out of the side of a cow you know the, no. the, the food is prepared in a certain way so i figure you know there there are ways you're going to be able to, pre- to, to present that kind of stuff that's not going to be as appalling as just chowing down on a plate full of you know scorpions or something very yeah that's the secret to it but i think the, the key thing here is that the actual fly and the wine that uh, hormone or uh, pheromone that it secretes can ruin the drink essentially it makes it taste a lot i think sour or bitterer even even if the fly was in there for a very very short amount of time apparently they said even if it just dropped in and you took it straight out it could still be enough to be tasted Mm. the chemistry prize was given to three researchers from portugal for measuring the degree to which human saliva is a good cleaning agent for dirty surfaces uh, this comes straight out of the book of things that everyone already knew, I think. Mm, um, I think so. All done the old spit and polish <laughs> on our shoes. Your kid's face. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But now the science. science. The science. <laughs> but this is actually in use by museum conservators and uh, p- people who are in charge of protecting very sensitive things are often just using a bit of spit and polish. My um, one of the most interesting things from this study, uh, and I, and, and it, I don't know why. I, I, for some reason, when I when I when I hear research like this, I, I like to try and guess what the science was before I read the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this case, uh, I was I was thinking about amylase, which is the primary enzyme found in saliva. Yeah, I was thinking and lo and behold, too. Yeah, mm, and lo and behold, this is the the one they seem to find has the most uh, clout to it. Um, uh, they say uh, alpha alpha amylase seems to be principally responsible for the excellent cleaning power of saliva, which makes sense because it's something that breaks down sugars, which actually a lot of dirt contains. Mm-hmm. And if you're polishing things, essentially all you're doing is smoothing out the chemicals in a lot of way that are already there rather than removing them. They, they broached the idea that uh, they could actually produce a cleaner based on uh, an amylase uh, preparation from a bacteria called Bacillus subtilis, which is common in soil uh, and some foods, uh, which is interesting. And it sort of actually makes a bit of sense as well, because if you have ever had uh, like food poisoning from something like rice, it's also a Bacillus uh, species that will be responsible for that as well. And they, they do produce these powerful amylases. So I sort of, I found, yeah, I found it interesting that they, they even like, they took a very esoteric subject and then tried to take it to the next level again after the study, which was, was kind of nice to see. Yeah, well, I'm all in favor of using this sort of research to then develop an, a cleaning agent that's based on that enzyme and is going to be safe, cheap to produce and um, relatively effective. The thing about using the saliva is that it's, it's quite gentle and easy to control how much rather than using a, like an artificial cleaner where you you know you, you may need to kind of experiment with the amount a tiny little bit of saliva is kind of easy to add a bit more to and they were just finding that it was a very gentle way of doing it without actually kind of doing too much damage especially to gilt surfaces which is mm. which it's apparently very good for mm. i think i read the same article and i particularly liked the quote I'm not actually spitting on or licking mold off the paintings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. Yes, was that a good thing. the article? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's an important distinction here. When we say cleaning, what what they really mean is they're not using it to sterilize surfaces, right? Like you, you no, wouldn't no, want to no. clean up your Absolutely. kitchen with spit. Uh, I, I, I somewhat suspect that would have the opposite 
uh, the opposite of your intentions. But certainly if you're trying to, yeah, like produce a sheen or sort of clean in the sense of like removing dirt specifically. Yeah, it's remo- removing grime and, and mm. slight oils and things like that, I think is what, they, what they're talking about largely. The one thing that I guess we don't know is how much does the diet of the person pollute, producing the saliva affect the actual um, usage of it? Like if you've got a rare oil painting and you've just had a big garlicky lunch, is that going to make it worse or better? Or mm. The medical education prize went to Akira Horiochi from Japan. <laughs> this is my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> For the medical report... Colonoscopy in the sitting position. Lessons learned from self-colonoscopy. And Peter, you're a gentleman of a certain age. Uh, You probably know more about this than most of us. Uh, What exactly happened here? Well, I have a history of um, of bowel cancer in my family. So, uh, and my father had it. His brother had it. His uh, their father had it. So, um, I'm I'm one of those people who is asked by their doctor to have frequent uh, colonoscopies, which I do. So, um, it's an interesting story for me. Except that uh, I don't have mine conscious and I don't have mine sitting up, which is uh, what this particular gentleman was interested in. Uh, and I and I certainly don't do them on myself. I was going to say you do DIY. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this particular uh, researcher was was kind of interested in uh, seeing, I, I guess, partially experiencing the the process to see uh, what kind of differences he would come across. Firstly, by doing it sitting up, which is not the way it's normally done, uh, and also uh, over a number of different times he took uh, he made different observations about uh, how the colonoscopy actually proceeded so uh, and and he, his conclusions were that there may be some advantages in fact to doing uh, colonoscopies on patients sitting up rather than in a supine position which is the way it's normally done so um, it, it's it's kind of hilarious that he actually did it on himself and I can't really imagine that but I guess that's you know a very good way of actually finding out what's happening because you can feel it <laughs> True. Mm. I guess there's that you have more control when you're doing it yourself and you have better mm. idea of what's comfortable for you as well. So there's that benefit there as well. I do worry a little bit that this research is going to spur on. We, we already know that these sort of coffee enemas have become somewhat popular. And uh, I just, I just, I really don't uh, want to see a sort of new eBay industry of people selling uh, self uh, colonoscopes. You think it's going to be the next big thing on Goop? That Gwyneth Paltrow yeah, is going to be. Check, yes. check, out your, check out your own bile. You know, <laughs> find out the perfect position for your bowel, bowel yoni egg. You know, it's just uh, I, I don't know uh, if. I mean, I, obviously, this is very interesting, but I, I can't imagine anyone that isn't actually like this person was a colonoscopist, right, or an endoscopist, um, a professional. I certainly wouldn't want to be responsible for my own colonoscopy. But the fact that you can sit whilst doing it is interesting because um, I think there are some benefits from just an anatomical point of view of being sat upright. Um, I don't know if you remember, it was all the rage a while back for people to discuss the correct way in which to use a toilet and that by actually uh, in a lot of countries there is a stool and that by uh, by putting your feet up on the stool as you do your business, um, you actually align your colon in such a way that you actually have a lot more healthy uh, release and yeah, and have just a better toilet experience. So I wonder if this research could still be helpful for colonoscopists generally though. I don't think he was suggesting that people should do it themselves. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was just, uh, he was able to do that. So he, uh, he made those observations. But it does you know, make me think of all the number of times that we've seen scientists doing experiments on themselves. And of course, famously mm. Barry Marshall taking the, sure. uh, the bacteria to prove that they caused stomach ulcers and things. Uh, and it reminded me also of uh, Leonid Rogozov, the Russian doctor in Antarctica, in I think it was the 1960, 1961 or so, who came down with appendicitis and being the only doctor on the station and no one else for 1,000 kilometres around, had to perform an appendectomy on himself. And yeah. uh, that, that's a, a huge undertaking in itself. But it's, you know, it's mm. self-experimentation, self-surgery uh, and all that sort of stuff is, is rife within science these days. And uh, it's easy to get... Uh, 
ethical approval if you do it yourself and don't ask anyone's permission, I guess. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, I think um, when you have to beg for forgiveness, it's a lot easier to <laughs> forgive yourself uh, than it is to front an ethics committee, which, let me tell you, is... Uh, <laughs> Not fun? Is, is, uh, I, I think I'd rather have the Colin off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Literature Prize was awarded to four researchers from the University of Queensland for documenting that most people who use complicated products do not read the instruction manual. Another mm. uh, study published in the Journal of the Bleeding Obvious. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, uh, I actually i am from QUT and uh, sometimes I, I'm not surprised about research <laughs> like this. It's sort of interesting, isn't it? That yeah, we all know that that we that we just don't read the manual. I think a part of it is hubris, though, right? We just mm. think that we're going to know how it works. Mm. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But the number of times I curse myself not for reading the manual after learning the hard way about how my product doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> uh, is too numerous. I think. Well, you see, I come from a I, I'm an older person, and I actually do read manuals, uh, and I, so I fall into the demographic of this study that says that older people tend to read the manuals more than younger people. Um, mm. But I am a manual reader. I actually do. I do mostly sit down and read, maybe not the entire manual, but I'll certainly sit down and actually kind of look at what the sections are and what things mean and that kind of stuff. So I think there's a few things at play, though. Firstly, mm. I think a lot of things are getting more and more complicated. You know, phones yes. aren't, uh, the cameras aren't just a matter of point and shoot anymore. There's so many settings to learn. So mm. I think there's that that means manuals are probably actually more important, so we should be reading them. The other thing is also the rise of the internet and YouTube. And I think particularly younger people these days get so much of their instruction on things from YouTube and internet sources than from the actual manual itself. Mm. Mm. There's also an attitude in the way that specifically uh, with software where, um, and this is something that started really decades ago, but but where software is written so that people were able to actually get useful results without having to sit and, and read a manual. So, And that's become more and more and more developed over the years so that now it's it's not unusual, for instance, in, in my profession to find a new piece of software and you don't really need to sit down and, and read the manual to get started. Everything in the user interface makes it pretty easy to get useful results pretty quickly. Uh, and that's kind of a newish thing for someone of, of my uh, vintage because it didn't used to be like that. And, and yet I think it's also interesting that for, given that so many people don't read the manual, manufacturers still publish these manuals yes. that are often books, novels or yeah. for some things. Mm. Oh, and, some, and sometimes they're really badly written oh the, the chinese yeah. translations and things yeah and that's <laughs> interesting English. too because you know if you have to struggle through something and you're kind of going what the you put that thing in the what i don't even know what they're doing here <laughs> but then you just give up because you know it is it is just way it's harder to read the manual than it is to just <laughs> try and figure it out i think as well i mean your likelihood to read the manual depends on your your level of a comprehension of the technology in general. So th there are a lot of things where I, I, I don't necessarily read the manual because uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty well conversed. Like I, I bought a new um, I bought a new audio interface uh, a few months ago, and I didn't bother reading the manual. I, I was pretty sure I could figure out how it worked. But my my housemates bought me a little camera drone for my birthday, and I've never used one of those before. And I spent a long time reading the manual because it, I sort of realized that I had almost no chance of just natively knowing how it would work. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I feel like men are probably worse at not reading the manual uh, than women in general. Um, the, the actual study says the opposite to that. Really? Yeah. Uh, the, the study said that, that uh, men are more likely to read the manual than, than women are. It's only a small, it was only a small margin from my memory. I can't actually find it. I'm just looking through the research now, but they, they found that men are more likely to, to actually make an effort to read the manual. I wonder if the type of product is important in that as well. Who knows? I, I don't think they were – I don't know whether they made that kind of oh, – they actually did, yeah. They went through different – there were different things, cameras, computer-related, kitchen equipment, AV, remotes, something called ubiquitous, I don't know what that is, and simple kitchen items were the things that they looked at. Women were significantly more likely to claim they had not read the manual than men. Hmm. Ah, claim. 
That's clean. important. Yeah. Yeah. Men maybe going to maybe they're that embarrassed they by yeah. <laughs> Certainly box certain stereotypes, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, James Cole, the principal lecturer in archaeology at the University of Brighton, he won the Nutrition Prize for calculating that the caloric intake from a human cannibalism diet is significantly lower (laughs) than the caloric intake from most other traditional meat diets. Well, yeah, I think we knew that. I mean, that's obvious. (laughs) (laughs) Are you speaking from your own experience again? Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) I'm sure that Neanderthals or whoever were like, no, I've really got to like min-max my meat consumption. (laughs) Because there have been human remains found with evidence that they have been butchered essentially to eat by other people. like The original paleo diet. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Ed. It had to be said. (laughs) (laughs) So we know that people ate other people. And I guess when you're considering something that humans have done, I mean, there's there can definitely be social and psychological and stuff, but it seems weird to say, oh, because it's not the most optimal source of calories that people wouldn't have turned to cannibalism to get calories. I Look, maybe I'm not following because um, they were saying, you know, that other other animals would be probably easier to hunt than a human and would provide more calories. I think they said like, a mammoth could sustain 200 humans for a week just from its muscles, which is amazing. Yeah, I, I think there's a few. So I, I'm, um, if you look at the the figures that they produced, one of the I think that there are two metrics which are important here. And so they they looked at the average total weight of the animal, the average amount of muscle per kilogram of the animal, and the average amount of calories per kilogram in the muscle, and therefore the total calorific value of the the creature. So uh, a mammoth, by being mammoth, I guess you know three thousand kilograms, uh, has a lot of muscle. Uh, definitely the largest that they looked at, but also the calories per kilogram of that muscle is high as well. So they humans have uh, a calorie per kilogram of muscle of 1,300, which is actually kind of middle of the range. Um, inter- interestingly, a reindeer, which is actually a fairly common thing for us to eat these days to farm, they have a lower calorie per kilogram than humans do in their muscle. But by sheer like by sheer like mass of the the mammoth and actually how high the number of calories per kilograms are it turns out that the mammoth is extremely uh i guess efficient because you you only need to kill one and every kilogram of meat goes a long way uh looking at this actually though and i I guess it's not so surprising bears which of course are hibernating animals they have a calorie per kilogram of muscle of four thousand and one bear provides a substantial amount uh something like six hundred thousand calories each so bears are harder to Hunt and kill, though. I reckon. That's, Absolutely. That's I mean, I don't imagine many humans were taking down bears. Mm. Mammoths were kind of slow and lumbering. They were easy to run away from. Bears are vicious, and I think uh, wouldn't have made great hunting. So, but it's interesting how if they did manage to take one down, they would have uh, possibly the effort would have been worth it. Although, you know, losing members of the hunting party probably not preferred. Well, you can eat, you can eat. Them. It was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> <laughs> but I think cannibalism was probably used more in a sort of survival setting where there's drought or famine mm. or they're in a location where there aren't lots of bears and mammoths around. You eat the weaker or the uh, easiest to kill person that you find, I guess. Absolutely. And certain ritualistic sure. uh, sort of reasons were sort of there as well. I, I think when people think of like, ritualistic cannibalism they think of like sacrifice and all these kind of weird things but really if you look back through history that that for the most part is not what human cannibalism has been about it's more about death rituals and sort of those kind of things so i I think it was more of just making the most of you know the situation when someone died and sort of uh, i know some cultures believe that the memories of the uh the memories of the person who died would sort of carry on if you ate them and stuff like that so and sort of very interesting, actually, the history of cannibalism in general. Grizzly stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. The Peace Prize went to a team of scientists from Spain and Colombia for measuring the frequency, motivation and effects of shouting and cursing while driving an automobile. And I feel we've probably all had some experience of this to some degree. 
What did they actually look at here and what did they find? They found that the, co- the, cause, the causes of aggressive driving are very complex, <laughs> <laughs> which is not surprising. <laughs> So these, uh, I think they all, most of them work at the University of Valencia where they are involved in traffic safety research. So they were aiming to describe the factors and perceptions related to aggressive behaviour uh, for people driving cars and uh, the effectiveness of insulting and shouting <laughs> as you do it. It's a, it's, a, it's a really, actually a really complex paper. I read through it a couple of times and I'm still not quite sure what it was that they, that, that, that they actually figured out other than that people normally are aggressive a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> was it, was yeah, aggressive, it was sort of... aggressive behaviour is very common. That, that seems to be the, the main takeout from this yeah, particular study. I, I, sort of, I sort of struggled to pass as well what, like, what the result of that is that, they, they found that, yes, these aggressive sort of gestures and, and swearing at people is, is high, but whether that actually affects the driving quality wasn't no. uh, immediately clear uh, to me. The, the figures in the paper, which is normally the most important part, uh, there's a lot of reasons why people um, like to shout at each other which is sort of interesting. So um, I like that the, the number one is uh, people breaking rules, which is uh, it's a very human thing, isn't it? To uh, the, it, it sort of invokes our sense of justice. You know, when you're following the road rules and someone just, just flies in the face of all that, it makes mm-hmm. you very angry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other one, uh, so these are almost double the rest. Uh, reaction to dangerous maneuvers is the, uh, the other high one, which, is, is, which of course makes sense because when you feel like you're in danger, you're you're much more likely to to um, make some kind of yeah, and then the other driver puts me in danger was the next one there, which is sort of I I, I don't know how they really pass the two. Uh, they seem very similar to me. Well, the interesting um, thing was that they didn't they didn't they were really bring conclusions about uh, about the effects of this behaviour rather than just kind of detailing the behaviour. And in their conclusions, they basically kind of say well, this is not generally good. Uh, but they don't actually give very much evidence at all why in this paper. This is generally yeah. good or this is not generally good, did you say? It's not generally good. You know, they're basically saying aggressive behaviour is not a good thing uh, and and the paper actually just shows how aggressive behaviour manifests, but there's no conclusion mm-hmm. as to why aggressive behaviour is not a good thing, nor do they offer any solutions as to how, you know, you can do anything about it. It's really just a data gathering thing by the look of it. Mm. So it's interesting they they've they've classified people's perception of the danger level of various things and not not surprisingly drink driving is at the top uh, with 9.1 out of 10 on the scale driving without a seatbelt is around 6.9 and shouting at others is 4.7 so uh, yeah it's sort of an interesting paper there they, they I mean yeah obviously they've it's kind of I guess interesting they they've gone into a lot of detail on like places you're more likely to experience this behavior and that kind of stuff but yeah it's very there's i I think it would be a a completely different study entirely and and interestingly just to go back to qut they actually have a large division uh of of they have a very probably one of the most advanced virtual driving suites in the world Mm -hmm. and they do a lot of testing actually on people's behaviors and and what how that affects their driving so this is something I think that maybe they would be well suited to test, you know, in a controlled environment, seeing how this kind of behavior does affect people's driving. Because I, I can't imagine it, it has no detriment, you know, like you are distracted, even if only for a second, by your fixation on someone else and not the road uh, during these incidents, I'm sure. I guess there's a, there's a number of ways you can look at it. There's that uh, venting and release of shouting and yelling at someone that might make you feel better and calmer. But there's also mm. the fact that you're doing something aggressive as well, which might make you more likely to uh, not concentrate and focus on what you're doing. Yeah, it, it's a funny one, but um, maybe we should all just be a bit more calmer behind the wheel. I think so. The Reproductive Medicine Prize was given to three mm. urologists for using postage stamps to test whether the male sexual organ is functioning properly as described in their study, nocturnal penile tumescence monitoring with stamps. Peter, you're a gentleman of a certain age. Oh, I go through a lot of postage stamps. It's not, 
not just the ones I'm sending out to my on my postage to my do, fans. Do people still post things anyway? Uh, do we have to explain to the younger listeners what a postage stamp is? <laughs> <laughs> the, the great thing about this particular uh, piece of research is that it's it's like classic um, ignoble in that mm. it sounds absolutely ridiculous uh, until you realise that what these guys have done has actually circumvented a really expensive piece of equipment mm. by mm. coming up with a method that is just really cheap. Cheap um, and non-invasive too. And and non-invasive. So, um, you know, it, it is a, it's a kind of classic. It's a great ignoble, I think. I really like how their method section is actually instructional rather than the classic sort of uh, like third person uh, narrative that a paper, you know. Yeah. So normally, normally a paper would be, uh, you know, Patients were asked to wear a brief, uh, a brief <laughs> type of shorts, and patients were asked to present their penis through the pl- uh, uh, the fly. But here it's one: wear brief type shorts. Two: bring your penis through the fly. And they use words like snugly, snugly, <laughs> <laughs> in italics for some reason. Um, yeah, uh, very interesting paper. This one it uh, circumvents uh, a few, <laughs> a few uh, of the. Uh, conventions of scientific reporting. There are some figures, luckily just of the uh, postage stamps and non, <laughs> non too detailed. So we should uh, break this down and actually explain mm, what we're talking mm. about. Um, for th- This is a 1980s paper, actually. Uh, yeah, 1980. Yeah, it's actually old um, research. And to know if, it, in cases of erectile dysfunction, it can be either a physiological, a physical problem or it can be psychological and stress-related often. But you don't necessarily know which one it is, except at night time, because I think it's most men, or almost all men really, have one to five erections at night time, usually while they're asleep. This is a, a purely physiological thing. It's not generated by your thoughts or the psychology behind it. So if during the actual act of sex you have difficulties with that, it's probably not a physical thing if you can get an erection at night time, but not during sex. So as a diagnostic technique, it's important to know which one you're dealing with in order to work on treatment for that. So these are stamps with a perforated joint wrapped around the penis so that when it swells during the night, that per- those perforations tear. If you wake up in the morning and they're broken and they're not joined again, you know that there was an erection at night and it's a psychological thing you need to work on or the other way around. So sure. it's, it's, it's great that it's non-invasive because you don't actually have to hook it up into a special instrument that's measuring fluctuations over the night and you can do it yeah, they at describe home. A, um, they describe a mercury pressure type device that I, I assume at the time must have been the gold standard for equipment in this, in this research area. Mm-hmm. One of the favorite things about this paper is that I actually learned a new word, which is tumescence, uh, yeah. which is the process of You need to swelling. read romance novels. <laughs> <laughs> apparently so. Apparently so. Um, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and finally, the economics prize went to a team from Canada, China, Singapore, and the USA for investigating whether it is effective for employees to use voodoo dolls to retaliate against abusive bosses. Uh, this is this is my favourite. <laughs> this is my favourite reason. Can you imagine just popping up with this like in a staff meeting? Look, I've just got some evidence-based, you know, strategies that we can apply. <laughs> Well, no, it's probably, I've just been on holiday to New Orleans and I got these really cheap voodoo dolls. Uh, <laughs> can we use them for science somehow? Mm. Now, this is to, to, to try and find out whether um, there is any advantage in uh, you le- eventing your uh, kind of dissatisfaction by sticking needles into a voodoo doll or actually throwing darts at a, a picture of your boss on a dartboard. Um, and turns out there are. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. Okay. So basically just people feel better after they just feel, taking out yeah, their aggression. There's some evidence that if, you know, if you have something to kind of, yeah, just deflect your your, your dissatisfaction onto, um, it, it makes uh, a difference to your attitude. I like this uh, this statement from the the science alert um, description of this uh, this this research. So uh, they're they're commenting on the people who got to use 
voodoo dolls or other sort of, I guess, physical representations but of, of virtual punishment. And it says those that did reported experiencing significantly reduced perceptions of injustice <laughs> after the voodoo doll <laughs> session. <laughs> After their boss died a horrible death. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this must explain after all the difficult conversations I have with their employees, why I always get these pains in the stomach and the chest <laughs> and the head. I, I just thought, you know, something I ate. But I, I liked how they, they actually had a term for, for using for actually using this process to which I'm going to com- remember and use often, and that is symbolic retaliation. <laughs> I like that. It's a great, great phrase. phrase. <laughs> I, I wonder if we might start seeing more workplaces uh, with you know symbolic retaliation clauses in contracts and maybe voodoo <laughs> dolls handed out or in yeah. sort of sta- a station where you can go and just beat something up. You know, I feel better now. I can go back to my old job. Yeah, you go to you go to HR and they say, now look, I'm just going to give you this and a little box of needles. <laughs> They'll have like a, a doll or something with an interchangeable head. Now, which boss was it? Right, let's just drag his uh, 3D printed head out. Test yeah. it. What I what I want to be party to is the uh, occupational health and safety meeting where they're like, well, yeah, we can reduce work stress, which is good, but on the other hand, we are providing needles to our employees <laughs> and just just going through, just like blowing their minds on the sort of. Uh, you know the, the pros and cons of giving giving uh, human like dolls to uh, to employees to to put needles into. But I I guess was there any sort of control to this? Is this does it have to be related to your boss, or can it be any sort of stress relief kind of just punching a, a punching bag or something? Is it necessarily have to be? A voodoo doll or something symbolic of your boss. Well, they, as I said, they did. Use, there was one part of the uh, I re- read somewhere that there was one part of it where they were talking about using a dartboard with a, mm-hmm. you know, dart, throwing darts at a dartboard with symbolic, you know, I don't know, photograph of your boss or something on it. But um, as near as I can tell from their paper, there's no kind of, <laughs> it's no control. It's just basically a, a data gathering exercise. Yeah. It's a typical psychology paper. In that the, it's inter- the introduction is uh, the introduction is substantially longer than the method. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, so far as I can tell, there was no there was there was basically the the, the null group that didn't participate in sort of stabbing the doll. Mm-hmm. But there there weren't there wasn't a sort of yeah like a, a parallel group that did a, a violent task that didn't necessarily have any uh, symbology behind it. So. Uh, I guess that would be an improvement to the study they could do, but uh, yes. Well, they specifically in the in the actual study they specifically kind of um, made that point of saying, you know, it's a person who you've got some grievance with um, mm. that they, that the voodoo dolls were supposed to represent. So you know, control. I guess you could have voodoo doll that didn't mean anything in particular and see whether it had any effect mm. but they specifically said it was supposed to be you know if you've got an you you have a perceived grievance that you can't really do anything about in a in a useful physical sense does does it work to have it deflected in this way someone you have a perceived grievance with i'm going to need a lot of dartboards <laughs> um <laughs> Well, you can you can assign each set of points to a different person, right? Just uh, print yep, out a wheel true. with twenty different people yeah, on it. That's right. It'd be quite interesting. <laughs> and also, I think it'd be quite therapeutic to sort of order the people by how many, you know, how annoying they are. So, like, they're they're, they're worth more points, you know, more, like starting at absolutely. one and going up to twenty. More <laughs> pins, get more pins in those ones. <laughs> oh, very good. I'm sure we've given uh, a lot of employees some good ideas there. <laughs> And I think that's our show. Uh, just go to scienceontop.com slash 311 for more information about this year's Ig Nobel Awards. Get your tickets to the Australian Skeptics National Convention in Sydney on October mm. 13th and 14th. Now, also, sorry to interrupt, but I believe they have a scholarship scheme as well ah, yes. that you can take part in. So if you are a student or you feel like you have uh, contributed to the public in some way that... Uh, might be worthy of you attending the conference at a, a discount or um, possibly for free. I forget, but it's certainly um, they 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 will help you get there if you if you show that you've uh, sort of you, you will get something out of it. So it's worth checking out the website and looking at the scholarships as well. Yeah, that's convention.skeptics.com.au uh, and book your tickets to see Dr. Pamela Gay and us 
for our live show in Melbourne on October 10th at scienceontop.com slash live. And as always, you can go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon and help us out. Thanks for joining us today, Ross Bolch. Yeah, it's always fun. Always good to be uh, back on top and uh, also be on this podcast. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to plug or where's the best place to find you on the internet? Yeah, so if you if you want to sort of follow my exploits, I guess at Ross Bolch on Twitter is a good place. Occasionally I play computer games, uh, Manadorks TV on Twitch, and uh, that's about it. Very good. And a big thank you as well, Peter Miller. Oh, it's my pleasure entirely. You've got a lot going on these days with film festivals and uh, movie re-releases. Is there anything you wanted to uh, plug? Or Yes, we, um, we just re-released a, a movie that I made with some friends 30 years ago, which was no mean feat. And uh, it was called Spirits of the Air, Gremlins of the Clouds. So you keep an eye out for that. It's a, an interesting, quirky Australian movie ba- made back in the 1980s when people did lots of weird stuff. When Australians did quirky movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <that's> <laughs> when Australians did movies. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> All right. And of course, thank you, Penny, as well. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. As you know, we used to have a problem at this ceremony. Many of the speakers would exceed their allotted time. And here's how we now solve that problem. Please welcome the charming, delightful, ever-so-cute Miss Sweetie Poo. <laughs> Miss Sweetie Poo is eight years old. Uh, Miss Sweetie Poo, would you please demonstrate what you'll do when a speaker exceeds his or her allotted time? Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Now, Miss Sweetie Poo, thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Miss Sweetie Poo, thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Miss Sweetie Poo, thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. We did, in fact, research riding on a roller coaster to help pass kidney stones. The real credit goes to one of my patients. My patient went on spring break with his family to the Walt Disney World Resort to the Magic Kingdom and rode on a little roller coaster called the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad Roller Coaster. (laughs) Now, he rode the ride, got off, and about two minutes later, passed a kidney stone. (laughs) He was so convinced that the ride had caused it that he got back in line and rode it a second time. Two minutes after his second ride, he gave birth to kidney stone number two. (laughs) He's feeling pretty cocky at this point, so he got back in line. I'll have to find my speech now. Why don't you chew on something while I find us some food for thought? And to continue the puns, I really like research I can get my teeth into. Um, As with most uh, scientific research, there's always a kind of bigger picture behind what we're trying to understand. And for me, I'm really trying to think about um, the behavioural complexities of our human ancestors like the Neanderthals. So we know that in modern humans, there's a whole range of motivations for cannibalism, from survival to warfare. Um, But, you know, perhaps in others, there's perhaps more than just meat for meat's sake. Uh, It turns out, calorifically, we're not uh, that nutritious compared to a horse or a bison or a mammoth, uh, which we know that were successfully hunted in the past. And we know that Neanderthals are increasingly more complex. They produce art, they have symbolism, jewellery, language and complex societies. So uh, final food for thought is that perhaps we should um, consider that our ancestors had a greater complex attitude to cannibalism in the way that we do. Because if we can gain greater understanding into them, we can gain greater understanding into ourselves. And isn't that what science is about and why we're all here? So thanks very much. We sought to answer Bugs Bunny's recurrent question. What's up, Doc?
When physically normal men sleep and dream, they have complete erections one to five times a night. Physically impotent men don't. In hospital, mercury strain gauge penile plethysmography was the standard method to measure nocturnal penile tumescence in 1978. <laughs> we developed an inexpensive stamp test. And here we are, 40 years later, on the campus of Harvard University, telling you all about it. By the way, the answer to Bugs Bunny's question is, and what was the question? What's up, Doc? <laughs> Our time. <laughs> Please remember this final thought. If you did not win an Ig Nobel Prize this year, and especially if you did, better luck next year. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>